everyone for showing up. Oops. Oh, recording. Huh? Got it. Okay. Just in case anybody doesn't want so, to. Uh, uh, if you read the introduction on the uh, on the event, um, I really would like this to be kind of a roundtable discussion. I don't have a presentation per se. Uh, I'm more interested in hearing what people have to say. Um, so I'll start off by just by saying who I am and where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm the new guy here. So uh, my wife and I had uh, just moved into Adiantum uh, a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, and we were just starting to get involved in the SCA when everything shut down. So you know, two and a half years later, I'm still the I'm still the new guy. Okay, uh, so I don't have a lot of. Uh, history or background in uh, how or why things are done here. Um, but I take it very seriously as the right and possibly even the duty of the new guy to ask questions. So I'm going to, uh, uh, to uh, take advantage of that prerogative and ask questions. So, um, what I was able to do just before everything shut down was to enter the uh, uh, Adiantum Baronial and then the Principality uh, Arts and Sciences competitions. And so I am now the Baronial uh, Arts and Sciences champion, and I am the Principality Arts and Sciences champion. Um, it is tradition here that the uh, that the champion uh, coordinates the next uh, competition. Uh, so the the next uh, baronial Ariantum baronial competition is coming up in January with the midwinter feast, and then uh, supposedly there should be a. Uh, a principality arts and sciences championship probably in February in South March, uh, uh, Klamath Falls, uh, although they haven't started planning the event yet. So uh, we'll see how, we'll see what happens there. So as the uh, current champion of, uh, in both uh, aspects, it's, it will be my honor to run the next competitions. Um, now, one thing that struck me, and again, you know, if I'm, uh, you know, being the new guy and I have my entire uh, experience in local arts and sciences competitions is like two events. Um, but it seemed to me that uh, participants participation at both levels was pretty low, that there were not many people entered, uh, which I thought was kind of sad. Um, uh, I've been in the SCA for 30 mumble years, and uh, uh, in other places, I've seen arts and sciences competitions thrive and be the, the arts and sciences uh, uh, event of the year. Um, and so, and also on top of that, uh, in the past year and a half or so, I've just being on Facebook in various groups, I've seen some discussions on arts and sciences competitions that give me the distinct impression that arts and science, that the word competition is not welcome in terms of arts and sciences. So I'd just like to understand why. Um, and, you know, if I'm going to be organizing the next uh, competitions locally. Um, I have some leeway in how those competitions are going to be run. And if there's anything that I can do to uh, improve participation, to make it a more welcoming, uh, fun event, I would sincerely like to do that. But again, with my limited background, I, you know, I can have my own opinions, but it's not, you know, I, I can't uh, 
uh, I can't speak for everybody else. So oh, I'd just like to find out what, you know, what people think about competitions. I'd like to hear why you do or don't enter competitions um, and get your ideas. And that's really, that's really what I would like to do here. So I'd like to just open up the floor. Other than that, I have no planned uh, uh, itinerary here. I have no presentation. Uh, this isn't about me. So would someone like to kick it off? I, I'll dive into it. How many, what year? I'm, hang on. I started in 89, so I'm over 30 years. So what about for everyone else? 86. 82. Yeah, okay. 78. Yeah. Really? <laughs> but Last year? But no, not really. Year? What I've noticed one is I've only been active since really since eighty six. I got exposed to the uh, the SCA in eighty six, but since I was actually got exposed to Expo was during Expo eighty six, and I didn't realize I thought they were from a pavilion, <laughs> so I didn't know that it was the SCA that I had encountered. But question: We're all here with decades, and and I think part of it is. You know, we've gone from the carpet armor, tea tunic, the, the, the sophistication, both as we learn, as we grow, the sophistication and the cost has gone up to play in the FCA. Um, the bar for research has gone way higher. It's certainly approaching much more academic. And even for me, it's scary. Um, I think part of it is, it is the increasing expectation maybe of perfection. And that's a thought where the, it seems that the, the bar is getting higher and that may be a perception just that I'm dealing with locally, I don't know. Um, I've done the thing where you break the ice by you, where you, uh, you do this arts and sciences competition, but it's silly. So there's no fear of failure. There's no, you, you document something absurd. Um, someone did the medieval formula for Coca-Cola. Someone else, we did a bog body. Um, it, it, I think if doing something that will allow the, it removes the fear of competition, it removes the, the language, uh, it, it removes the concern if, if people are good enough. I mean, sometimes the irony is if you're really good at something, it can be scary for other people who aren't good at something. And luckily I'm not really good at anything, so I'm not scary at all. <laughs> well, I actually, I lie. I actually agree comfortable with what I do. <laughs> I completely agree with your points there as, as to reasons. Um, for me, I've, as somebody who's judged a gazillion contests over the years <laughs> pretty much if I, i've added events some people are like oh hey you could judge this and i'm like really okay fine <laughs> but um <laughs> but uh what i run into and something that i've taught various classes on is uh the fear of documentation that's that's just a huge one for people and what i always try to emphasize is it doesn't have to be a research paper it doesn't have to be scary um what the the one minute version of my one hour class is documentation is three things what i did how i did it why i did it that way and that could be scribbled on one little piece of notebook paper or it could be a 30 page report um but even learning about bibliographies when i did swan uh in 2007 or 2008 i didn't even know how to do a bibliography so you know I mean, even that was sent back to me, not negatively, please understand, but right. okay, this is the form format you need to do. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah. right. And then, this one and then, is not like, a that's, that's a tough one though. I mean, but yeah, I don't think that's where people would be jumping in necessarily. I mean, okay, yeah, yeah, Swan is tough <laughs> <laughs> um, and amazing. Uh, and I can certainly talk quite a bit about Swan, but I think sometimes it's as simple as where do you begin? Yep. Maybe even if 
I mean, we've got the computers now. You know, when I was doing Swan, it was by books. What if, um, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, Elanta. Which one? Rodnovar. 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 Sorry? Rodnovar. Or okay. Steve works also. I, I'm going to have to go with Steve because I, this, our, our system is not precise. What if that you... Works. Say you set up and you've got a tablet and you've got a couple books. Hey, I'm going to document the origin of my cup or my, my meat or my beer. And if you kind of broke it down and said, hey, this is how I started. This is what I did. This is what I learned. And kind of walk people through a single item, a single safe item. Everyone's got a cup. Everyone has probably drank beer or eat something, mm -hmm. you know make it about food because that always gets people's attention um and and just kind of lead it through um i run arts and sciences in uh appledore and it's really simple you know it's just i've i sometimes have a guest judge and it's often just me but it's just keeping it playful keeping it simple and once people kind of go, oh, oh, that's what that's like. It's not so scary. It's not so terrifying. Because each one of us, I'm going to assume, brings in a huge skill set that may be intimidating to other people. I'm not particularly intimidating. I'm always the one being asked. Like, if there's a crowd, I'm the one that gets people talked to. But I think breaking it down step by step removes the the fear and don't even have a the word competition in it if you don't want to just that might be off-putting might be as you said the word competition just might be off-putting for people maybe you could have a display and have the option you know for feedback or for or for ranking of some kind of score scoring i guess you would say you know just just to because that word display tends to kind of be, as you say, less frightening for people. And and maybe if you just like, hey, come come put something in this display. And then if you really want to hear how it might, you know, uh, pan out in terms of a, a scoring card, just check that box. Yeah. And if you don't, or maybe you just want some feedback, that's great yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have had the uh, uh, online Athenaeum. Uh, yeah, format. I love that. And, yeah. and that seems to be wildly popular. Yes. So there doesn't seem to be a lack of people who are interested in talking about their art. Yep. Um, and, you know, so, yes, I, 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 I get that. And it's, that seems to be a much more favored uh approach or venue uh, and just take the uh, uh, take the word competition out of it. Um, Alan. Oh, okay, Alan, the other thing I find intimidating is the scoring rubric. If we were to build a museum quality, Alan, why don't you talk? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he had to pop off or something. <laughs> oh, there he is. Woof, woof. woof. Yeah, the, uh, the scoring rubric, uh, one of the things that they score very highly is the method of construction. And a, a wooden spoon, I could carve just using hand tools. Heck, I could probably carve using hand tools I built myself. But if I were to build this beautiful broke guitar, then I'm using table saws, I'm using band saws, I'm using routers, I'm using modern equipment. Uh, if you wanted me to build a broke guitar using nothing but hand tools, I'd tell you to go whistle up a rope. I just don't have time for that. Nonetheless, you know, you're, you're generally, you're still going to just purely in scores, you're going to score lower than somebody who did do it that way. I mean, you may score very highly nonetheless for the complexity, for the, you know, accuracy and so forth, but it's, it's just going to happen, even though it makes you know, and this argument is made all the time with metal, for instance, hardly anybody that is making their own ingots, they're getting some yeah. material that was machine processed. So I mean, there's always, 
I mean, it's understood that that's going on. But if I do see somebody who's making an instrument with hand tools, wow, they're going to get bonus points from me. So yeah, it's tricky. But I guess what you can do is just excel on all the other aspects. You know, just give your the research, the the finish work, and everything your your utmost. And you know, seriously, I was I was asked to be a, a student judge uh, at Principality and somebody submitted a board, a piece of wood. And I was a student here, you know, sitting with all these master judges and I had to explain to the judges that this guy had started by felling a tree, splitting the wood, sawing the wood, planing the wood. I mean, yeah. he's got a board, it's a board. I could go down to Lowe's and pick one up for about five bucks. Yeah. But my word, well, uh, I, I felt bad that this guy had picked a piece of wood that had a knot in it. I said, uh, so what did you learn? He said, I'm avoiding pieces of wood that have knots in it. I said, well, there you go. Yeah. And that's something that's great to put into documentation. If you, you know, even if it's just a sentence that says, I hand you to this board, starting with an ax and then with a, I don't know, whatever mm -hmm. list of tools you would use, <laughs> not a woodworker here, you know, that's, that's going to make an impression. And I have a similar anecdote like that with somebody in the, um, the decorated useful object competition at Eggles, which is probably the one I've judged the most. And, um, you know, somebody won with a simple stone amulet with a, like a rune on it, but he had gone out, he had found a rock, he had found another rock, made a, you know, made a tool out of it, chipped the, the carving, created the hole with a, you know, with a stone awl and all of that. And so that was really impressive. And that's the kind of thing where people in the populace often go, but it's just a piece of rock with a rune on it. Who cares? You know, what, what about this beautiful armor or whatever? But that's the nature of a competition that does emphasize, you know, authenticity and, and that degree of, of tool making. It's not just it's hard for people to understand that the flashy thing isn't always going to come out on top. So, I mean, I think it's important to, to educate people about what judges are looking for. You know, that's, that's a big one because a lot of people just can't see the rhyme or reason. Why did that win? And this one didn't, I don't know. <laughs> and I think, Oh, sorry. In part, Alan, like if you were to build a guitar um, and you say you use modern tools, but if like, if, if you went to salon, for example, and you showed your guitar, and in your documentation, you would say, I'm just going to say, I had to take my saw and my skill saw and cut this. Now, technically, we would understand that, that sometimes you would have to use a modern thing, the same way we don't see glasses, the same way we don't see orthotics. But if you demonstrate the knowledge that you yeah. know, the process by which a piece of wood for the base of your guitar had to be formed and shaped so even if sometimes the physicalness is not always possible, but if you demonstrate the knowledge that this would have happened, this would have happened, here's this tool here, here's a picture of this tool here, here's an example of this here, then you can break down that. Um, uh, Mistress Lynette Python, anyone? She's from Seagirt and she was arts and sciences champion 20 years ago or something like this. And she did a, uh, oh, come on. It's Richard II and it's all those angels. It's an incredible piece of work and I can't remember what it's called. <clears throat> it's all blue, but she had a travel prayer, but it was made of soapstone, but she carved it out using a power tool because she couldn't do it by hand. But it's also the work that an apprentice would have done. So that power tool acted as an apprentice so that they yeah. did the work and then she was given Wilton, Wilton triptych. <laughs> okay. That's great. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. So it's part of it is we live in a modern world. Are we expected to do everything 100% medieval? It depends. But can we demonstrate that knowledge? That yeah. we know that it had to be planed by hand with this tool. Here's a picture. And however you finish and make a guitar, 
you, you're demonstrating your knowledge and awareness of what would have been done and acknowledging that maybe there's a, a woman had to who couldn't wear fur so she chose other things even though her persona would have worn fur so there can be ethical reasons there can be physical mechanical reasons there can Economic be safety reasons, reasons. Are a big one because but as long as you know and demonstrate your awareness that it would have done this way medievally, you know, in Italy or Scotland or wherever. So it's, it's demonstrating that awareness, you know, whether or not you would ever make a, an instrument entirely by hand. Well, that, that's an unknown, but it's there. It's, that is, there is that potential. Yeah, that's a really crucial aspect for me as a judge is that if somebody can indicate that they did know and they that's where I what I call rationale and, and that's the that's the why I did it that way is that rationale falls under that of just um yeah I'm always going to be happier if somebody says like I said I, I know this should have been wool but wool's too heavy and I have a physical disability that that doesn't work for me that's I'm going to say that is totally valid or even I bought this fleece because it's what I could afford also valid, you know, but the effort is there and the knowledge is there. Mm -hmm. I think you've got a couple of issues there that we're coming from a perspective of people who have a bit more experience maybe than a lot of the newcomers. And hang on a minute, moved my headphones like it. So, um, when you're not coming from the perspective where we're sitting today, you've got people who say, oh, I really want to do this thing and this is fun and I love doing it. But maybe they're just not booky. Maybe they're not into reports and writing things down and researching. And so they don't want to compete because they just learned how to do the thing. And they don't understand that doing the thing has value and that sharing that they've done the thing has value. So, so we need to start with that on our more local level events to work up to it. And then once that hurdle has been cleared for some of them, I think the next thing is just lack of sharing the information in a way that it's not, we're going to have a test at the event. You don't, you don't want to do pass like you're the back test. in school. Yeah. 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 Competition equates with final exam. And who's so going to lose? <laughs> so so well, there's I, that piece. Well, and, but I there's think also, that, go ahead. Well, I think there's a big issue here, though, that, of communication. Yes. Because, for example, Steve brought up the issue that he has to run one, maybe two um championship competitions yep. well that by its very name implies a pretty high level of expertise you know i mean you you want people who have done well enough to be the champion i mean the description of a champion is help defend the barony and say you had an arts and sciences competition so well, let's send out our arts and sciences champion and he or she can you know do the he thing and show what he's got and you know make audiantum proud or make the summits proud that's a whole different level of competition than say an eggles competition um you know big thousand person tourney with a, a, a nice beefy prize, but still you're not purporting to be the champion of anything. You're just doing the thing you do well and wanna be, you know, see how you shape up against other people. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's levels of competition and that needs to be made clear because you certainly wouldn't I wouldn't think want someone to enter their first competition and have it be a championship competition unless they were just very competitive and wanted to go gung ho anyway, in which more power to them. You know, that's great. But it could be intimidating for someone else when they saw what people were entering and the, um, you know, the criteria 
that's another sore point with me is that most competitions, except perhaps for Kingdom Arts and Sciences Champion, don't publish their judging criteria. How can you enter a competition and ask in any reasonable way to be judged if you don't know what you're being judged on? Here, That's here. setting people up for failure and disappointment. Yes. Um, which is why I love the Kingdom ANS rubrics, because you could take those. You don't, you know, you're not expecting very many people to score in the top category in any or all of them at a local level. But what they provide, what any set of judging criteria provide, is basically a roadmap for what you need to do to be successful in this particular competition. If the competition right. is for newcomer first year, you know, first garb you've ever made, well, your criteria are going to be way different than if you're doing, you know, baronial champion. So I think that part of what we need to do when we set up competitions is make it really clear what we're looking for, what, you know, what, what is the level of expertise that we're hoping would be, you know, competitive for this competition, um, and then make clear how those people are going to be judged by providing the criteria and then make sure that the judges are competent. And by that, I mean familiar with the criteria that they have to use to judge, have some knowledge of what it is that they're judging. I mean, I have been asked, oh, it's like, oh, you're a Laurel, you could judge this. Yeah. Pottery? What do I know about no. pottery? Yeah. You know, ask me about enamels. I know something about enamels, not as a producer, but from an artistic point of view. But uh -huh. pottery, eh, you know, so that, you know, just because you have a hat doesn't mean you get the job. It's you, you need to have people who, you know, if it's a costuming contest, have some familiarity with a broad range of costuming. If you're opening your costuming to any time period or you have a panel of judges with three people who do, you know, kind of cover the SCA time period, because that's our problem in the SCA. I mean, is it is it? recreation in the museum or research sense or is it past the 10-foot rule that's a world of difference yeah um, okay if i could uh, ju just uh, follow up on uh, a couple of things that you that you brushed on there um you you brought up the fact that the um uh that the champion you know, in my situation, the champion is now the uh, uh, the the coordinator of the next event. Well, I have certainly learned in uh, many years in the corporate uh, world that uh, artisans do not necessarily make good managers, or they don't necessarily want to be managers. <laughs> Uh, but they, but but the only way to yes. get ahead in the corporate world is to become a manager. So you get a lot of people. Uh, it's the Peter principle. You got to get a lot of people that are uh, uh, promoted into something that they have no interest or uh, or aptitude for. Um, do people see that as a uh, as a drawback, or is that kind of so far down the line that people don't even don't really think about that that much? I suspect they don't think about it. And yeah. as a former territorial baroness, I've got a big, ugly opinion here, which is that if this is a championship for a barony, then the baron and or baroness, it's their championship tourney. And if they would like the champion to supervise it, that's fine. But I think it's the Baron or Baroness's job to organize it in terms of doing the management stuff because their management. Well, well, the the uh, at least the way it's the way it's been presented 
to me is other people are responsible for the event itself. Uh, I don't, I don't have to be the autocrat. I uh, coordinate the the competition side of it. Um, cool. But but also I've been told basically, hey, it's yours. Do with it what you will. Now. Okay, so I've entered some competitions in, in the past, and I kind of have an, have some ideas, and you know I'm a I have a I have experience as a business manager. Okay, so it doesn't really phase me to uh, to to take control of something like that, but I could see that freaking some people out. Well, uh, so I just wonder if people think about that, or if that's just kind of that's that's too far down the line. People don't necessarily, you know that. That's not something that's going to discourage uh, people. Definitely isn't something I've ever run across anybody worrying about, which, you know, maybe they should be. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I guess to my mind, you know, the responsibility in that case is to is really to, you know, find the judges, select the judges to select the forms, rubrics you're going to use, whether or not you don't necessarily have to make them up, but you have to look at some and decide if those are the ones you want to use or if you want to modify them uh and those things i think should be within the scope of somebody who wins that championship but you know there is a little bit of, a, of autocratish stuff about that but i think it kind of comes down comes more down to just uh systemic thinking like how do you think it should work and that's where you have that latitude to Say, well maybe i want to do it a little differently this time right and and that's kind of, so that's kind of where i'm coming from by asking this question in the first place is that it, it seems to me that if you have add uh, hand this responsibility to someone who's not really prepared for it then they're going to say oh well i guess you just do it the way it was, it's, was done last year and the year before that and the year that's... before that and there's and there's no there's no institutional learning. There's no uh, no asking questions. So, you know, being being the new guy again, I'm uh, uh, I take the opportunity to ask questions. That's uh, good. Well, and here's a thought that I mean, a competition says you're competing. Somebody's going to come out as best whatever that means in this context. That's appropriate if you're choosing a champion. You want your champion to be the best at the thing. You know, the best fighter, the best archer, the best thing maker, whatever it is. If your goal is to geek out, have a good time learning or teaching or seeing new stuff and having an oh wow moment, then maybe the better format is the display. And you can, you know, I mean, one of the things I love is when people give a little card or a little favor that says, I really loved your display, um, which is a little attaboy, you know, from somebody you probably don't even know, but they leave something on your thing at a display. And it's like, oh, cool. Somebody liked what I did. And even better is the person who sits down with you and said, oh, my God, that's so cool. How did you do it? You know, and it's like, Ooh, OK, you know, you're lost for the next hour and a half which is what for me the SCAL is all about anyway. So maybe we make things into competitions that don't really need to be. It, you know, it depends on what, what we're after. You know, if we want yeah. the best person to represent X, then yes, you want a competition. Well, I, I'll yeah. give you a perspective from one who is not competitive. I, it is just not me. I don't need or desire to achieve some title or award. Or just, I don't like the competition. It's a little daunting to me. I never feel I'm good enough anyway, so I'm just not going to compete. If I won, I would think somebody took pity on me. It just, my psyche is set up in that weird twisted way. But I love to show the stuff I do. I would love to sit down like we do every week, we have ANS and say, hey, what are you working on? Let me show you. This has been so much fun. And here's what I learned. Anya and I and Helen had a great conversation about Norse garb. And Anya shared information I'd never heard before. I went, wow, that's so cool. I thought I'd researched that. 
I got to do more. I love that aspect. The geek out part. Sharing things at a display. That's my thing. Entering a competition. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I am not going to do that. But I love being able to be ANS minister here. I know I'm not great at it. I jumped in both feet in the middle of a plague and I get that. But I love that I can encourage other people to try to do the things. Get out there, try it, look. This is exciting. Have you looked at this? Hey, this is cool. I have a link I wanna share with all of you tonight that Catherine of the Lakes gave me. She's at the college this year and there is an online Zoom being taught by an instructor who, um, and, and I'm saying this now because this fits in with what I'm trying to demonstrate. One of her professors shared that there is a Zoom meeting for students, but it's open to the public. You can all go. And it is Professor Michael Dietler from the University of Chicago's Department of Anthropology delivering a talk on humans and alcohol. Steve, you would like this. The archaeology of a deeply entangled relationship. He's talking about brewing and the history of humans and alcohol. And this is a link I get to share with everybody. I just got it this evening, so I haven't shared with anybody yet. You're the first. And it's tomorrow. I don't have a lot of time to spread this. This is the geeky thing I love to do. This is why I want to get out there and help others do this. Maybe they'll get all excited and say, ooh, I want to compete. I think I can do this. And by competing, I can show others they can do better. I get this, the mindset. But, but there's that level. I'm not likely to ever enter a baronial or principality championship competition. It's just not, not my thing. Yet. No, no, I'm not well, likely people... to. It's just not my thing. <laughs> but yeah, one well, day that the that drive will push you and the competition is almost incidental to your journey and experience. I don't know. I think you're missing I don't know. I think you're missing a distinction in a personality distinction. There are people because I'm a laurel and I also don't really like entering competitions or you know, competing. And it's like the introvert extrovert thing. Some people are energized yeah, and inspired by competition. They, they find that exhilarating and, and yeah. filling and all that. Some people are more inspired and exhilarated by the sharing aspect. Not to say that a competitor can't also share. Of course they can. And they do. But, but it's just about what really recharges your, your buttons. Yeah. And some people just, yeah, really want to enter every competition they can. They want to prove themselves. Yeah to themselves and to other people. So I, I don't think it's necessarily convincing somebody, you know, if that's really not their path. But, you know, this discussion this evening is about championships and how do we get the attendance and the interest in them peaked a little bit. There's a few folks you're probably not gonna get like me, but I'm sure happy to go and share the word <laughs> for those that do want it. So, and I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think no, I was going to say Brynjar has his hand up. So. Yeah, um, so uh, Brynjar has had his hand up, so let's hear from him. And then I just saw a, uh, a, uh, a message from right. Cindy uh, who would like to know what we're talking about. <laughs> so um, I have a, a years upon years of knowledge and, and experience in the arts and science community in a different, different organization, but they, they have much the same struggle that I see the SCA has. And that is, um, like you're saying, it's, it, it feels like a daunting task. It feels like you have these, so many expectations, especially with documentation and everything else. But what, what I found, so I've entered uh, Baronial and Summit Ch Championship. Um, I've entered Baronial twice, some at once, and each time I, I got fantastic feedback, which helped develop and push and, and give me additional um, 
pathways and information. Um, it, every c competition I've entered, I've had laurels or just people who are experienced in what I was talking about um, ask if I needed help or if I if I wanted some assistance and maybe helping with my documentation. Um, those are just avenues and connections that I wouldn't have had if I had entered. Um, so as far as getting people involved, I think part of that is going to be to reduce that, to let them know that documentation is not, not necessarily focusing on the historical aspects of everything. Documentation can simply be a series of photographs and explanation of how you did your thing. That's documentation. Um, and then historical links can all come later. It all starts with that first step of saying, hi, this is what I'm doing. I really could use some additional help. Can someone help me? Is that necessarily has to be done in a competition setting? I don't think so. Um, and like was being said earlier, um, I also was one of the people that was, that was sponsored by Laurel to present my arts and science at Eagle. And I got, I just showed everything I had. And I had a lot of people talk to me. Oh, you're doing this. Here's some help. Here's this, here's this. So I think what we need to do first is to get people comfortable in what they're doing. In order to do that, I think a simple ANS display is maybe the right way to go. Hey, we want to see you. We want to see what you're doing with your arts and sciences. Show us how you're doing things. Maybe you can inspire someone else who's stuck. Maybe someone else can help you if you're stuck. Um, and then as people get more comfortable, as they start talking and learning that they're not being singled out, they're not being scrutinized, or then judged. maybe they'll enter more competitions if that's where they want to go. All right. Well, thank you. Also, um, Cindy. If Cindy, I can reference. Oh, sorry. Uh, Cindy posted a, uh, uh, a message earlier about um, uh, just wanting to find out kind of what we're talking about, what are, you know, what uh, arts and sciences competitions are. Uh, Cindy, where are you? Where are you? Uh, I'm in uh, Glenmere. Okay. All right. I'm from, I'm unfamiliar with the geography around here. Where is that? Uh, Glenmere's Olympia area. Okay. Washington. All right. Cool. Uh, so, so arts arts and sciences competition. So you know within the SCA. Uh, we're a uh, we're a medieval we're a uh, uh, you know medieval history. Uh, okay, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Yeah, here. somebody sorry. may have their may need to check their setting. Yeah, maybe turn off speakers if we're not speaking. Okay, all right. So let's try this. Um, so, uh, you know, in addition to the, you know, you've, you've got, you know, fighters fight and, um, fighting by definition is competitive. Uh, you have winners and losers. And so, um, you know, different geopolitical areas will have their own, uh, uh, champions in armed combat areas. Uh, likewise, in the arts and sciences, uh, we have, um, you know, there will be an arts and sciences uh, representative or champion for a barony or a principality or a kingdom. Uh, so it seems a bit weird or counterintuitive to say, okay, how do you have a competition where you compare armory and uh, uh, costuming and uh, woodworking and choose a, uh, a winner. 
So basically the, the way it's generally done is there hopefully is some uh, sort of agreed upon metrics where even you know different types of skills can be uh, graded as to um, uh, where did you get your information? How do you, uh, how did you determine how to do this thing? Um, what, what does your final product look like, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's possibly using uh, uh, medieval methods or uh, approximating medieval methods with modern tools or, you know, there are a lot of different ways to go at it. Um, and so the, um, uh, at a lot of events, there are uh, just arts and sciences uh, demonstrations. There'll, people will put stuff out and uh, people will come by and talk about them. Uh, no stress, no, uh, you know, and hopefully good feedback. Uh, but then we do have, you know, typically once a year in different uh, geopolitical areas, there will be a competition where people are, you know, there are judges and people are graded and, uh, you know, and there is a winner at the end of the day. Uh, so what we're kind of trying to get at is how, uh, what are people's feelings about competitions? And I'd like to know how to improve uh, participation in competitions. Now, just to say for, for my, uh, from my background, uh, okay, so, uh, you know, you were talking about how different, different personalities uh, approach things in different ways. Uh, uh, I am very much the introvert, and I am very competitive. Uh, uh, my wife is the eternal extrovert. My wife will, can stand in a supermarket checkout line, and by the time she's checked out, she's got photos of everybody's grandchildren and, uh, uh, and you know, contact information and knows their dog's names. Um, but she just absolutely despises the concept of competition. Um, so I guess, you know, opposites attract. Um, for me, I, I like the competition format mostly because it goads me to actually get things done. Uh, I'm one of those that if, you know, if there were no deadlines, nothing would ever get done. Uh, so I kind of need the, I need that deadline to actually finish something, uh, do it to the best of my ability and put it out there. It's not necessarily so much the, you know, the conquering and uh, aspect of it. It's more just it goads me to, to do my best and, and, and get it on the table. Uh, okay, so any other, somebody else? Well, I have a sort of an odd perspective on championships because both of the times I've won, I didn't expect to. Expect to. Uh, the first, I ended up becoming the Alpine Scholar um, a number of years back because one of the people in the household was stalling at getting his, his art out there where people could look at it. And I, and he finally said, cause I was nagging him and he finally said, all right, I'll enter if you enter. And then I won the thing, which really shocked the bleep out of me. Um, but I wasn't really doing anything differently from the way I normally do stuff. Uh, my thing is teaching. I, anything I know how to do, I will teach. Um, and I actually say a lot of the time, poke a button and a lecture will fall out because I do that. Um, drives people nuts sometimes. The other one was a similar kind of a situation. I Somebody said to me, well, you do Bardic stuff. Uh, we don't have enough entrance in the competition. So would you do something? So I ended up 
because I couldn't sleep well that night. I ended up practicing on a couple of stories all night and then I won the competition. And that's still, you know, I'm not competitive. That's not my thing at all. Um, but what I can do is talk. What, and I, I like demos. I really like demos um, because I will talk endlessly about the stuff that I've brought with me. Um, people here have heard me do it, you know, where I'm talking about my embroidery stuff that I've been playing with tonight. Uh, the funny thing was, though, with the Alpine Scholar Competition, I had no idea who the judges were at all. I didn't know what the rubric was that I was being judged against at all. All I did was I presented my stuff. And there were some things with experimental archaeology that I, uh, I was a request for at least one was experimental archaeology. So I pulled stuff together, stuff that I'd been working on for 30 years at that point, I think. Um, and talk about simple, it was balls. Some of you took the class, uh, but medieval homemade playing balls. Um, and that was my experimental archaeology thing because I tried all of the stuff and I had bits and pieces of, of the stuff. So I didn't win because I'm competitive. I won because I had the stuff and whatever it was matched up with whatever the rubric was that I haven't a clue. Um, I didn't do anything different. And so for me, I don't like entering competitions. That, that's, not, that's not me, but I'm like Atlanta. I like showing off my stuff and I love telling people about my stuff, whatever it happens to be, and teaching people how to do it. Um, actually, one of my favorite ones from Midwinter Feast a couple of years back, uh, I had a kid come up. I was demonstrating the balls and I had some kits with me and I showed him how to get started. And then he got tangled up. So he went and found his mom. And so I showed her how to make one. And from what I understand, they've made like several dozen and the boys have lots of fun throwing them at each other. Um, but that's cool for me. That's my cookie, my, my doggy biscuit, my treat is to mm -hmm. find out something like mm -hmm. that. Um, that and totally not a competition. Um, a little girl, uh, because I had enough balls to give away to all of the smalls at one event. Um, she got one that actually was filled with human hair, hair off my head. So she calls it her Anya ball. And she found me three years later. Okay, this little kid was four at the time, or smaller. And she found me three years later, came up to me and said, see, I still have my Anya ball. And I still cheer up thinking about that. I'd rather that than a competition any day of the week. And I've run a number of them. So, you know, I've, I had to run the one for Alpine Scholar. And back when Rivers region was still a thing, I ran that that championship a number of years running. So, okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you. No, good comments. Uh, Cindy uh, had a comment. Uh, are there levels of competition? Um, uh, you know, uh, beginner, intermediate, uh, uh, expert. It depends on how the competition is set up. Uh, it's not necessarily the case and is often not the case. Uh, that's one thing that I've been wondering about uh, rather than like, for example, we, we have, uh, we refer to them as the judging rubrics. It's basically, it's, uh, you can go online and you can see the uh, uh, the you know the list of criteria by which you will be judged, uh, and it's it's graded. It's like you know you get so many points for this level of of uh, achievement and so many points for this level of achievement and on up. Um, maybe one way to handle it would be to say. Um, you know, you could just enter as an apprentice level, for example, just to give it a name. And uh, apprentices will just be graded at, 
you know, the, the rubric, the same rubric will be used. You just go up like the first two or three levels of the rubric. It, and you could just blot out the rest of it. Uh, maybe uh, you can enter at a journeyman uh, uh, stage, in which case a few more of the levels of the rubric are used. Um, so that's, uh, that's a very good question. It's not something that I think we use enough of to be able to encourage people to start. Uh, as Brynjar said, uh, you can enter it at, you can enter any level and you are graded at the level at which you are. But it seems to me with the rubric, if, if you're actually looking at the rubric and it goes all the way up to, uh, you know, this documentation is publishable. Uh, and, you know, it starts at, you know, at a very basic level and goes and there's an expectation that the, the documentation should be publishable. I can readily see that that would be intimidating. Um, <coughs> sorry. Yes, Brynjar, your hand is up. Thank you. I, I, I find that's the easiest way to not interrupt someone. Um, yes, and, and as I sit and think about it, you're right. In most of our, uh, I guess, uh, designed and, and you know, uh, competitions are exactly that way. Um, but oftentimes, if you look at the events, events will have small competitions, and those might be the best way to get introduced, especially if it's a local event. Um, you know, you have a local uh, barony that's holding a small competition for maybe um, cooking or, uh, you know, more focalized um, thing. That That's a great place to start because you don't have that rubric necessarily to deal with. Um, and it's, I guess, smaller focus. Um, so that might be a, a place to start for someone who might be interested in in the competitions, in, in, developing, in developing what they're doing to a higher level. Uh, that's just my insight um, and, and my thoughts. <laughs> By the way, I've only been doing this for like three years, so I don't have a large pool of knowledge in the SCA as far as their arts and sciences. Okay, I saw a couple other uh, comments go by, but I didn't necessarily catch them. Uh, um, if uh, if anybody has a comment, the one I I know Assault uh, posted a uh, a link to a uh, I think it was a YouTube uh, discussion on how to use the rubrics. I think yes, and um, there's also the Alan posted the link to the on tier um, judging forms which make great guides for looking at your own work if you're preparing for a competition and saying, well, have I done the things that they're asking for? You know, or um, if there was uh, some other rubric, I mean, you, you need to have the rubric, but I wanted to bring up the fact that um, one thing that would help with a competition would be to use, um, a thing that Raven used in her class, um, it, it's sort of a high to low historic authenticity. And it gives what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 levels. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Raven? Um, sure. Uh, I did want to comment also on, on the, the levels thing, just that, you know, it's interesting because I've seen that pretty often in costume judging with, that you can indicate I'm a beginner, I'm an intermediate, I'm an expert, but not very often in other, others. And I think that is a good idea because not every judge, but I, certainly I as a judge will cut people a little slack if, it's, if they're a beginner and you know, they're making the effort, they're trying, they're entering a competition, that's cool. You know? And um, you know, one of the criteria that I like to kind of have on a judging sheet is if I, when I design them is something like mission accomplished, i.e. 
Maybe they weren't setting out to make the most drop dead amazing outfit of all time. They just wanted a warm cloak. Did they make a warm cloak? Okay, good job. You know, that gets you some points with me. Um, as far as the levels of authenticity thing, um, it's kind of a, you know, a very unmedieval thing, a PowerPoint of, um, with images. Cause I find that uh, speaking of documentation is kind of abstract, it's very wordy and maybe showing images would help uh, people really get a handle on what's more authentic versus less authentic like why did my my piece was beautiful why did i score low on authenticity and um you know so at the bottom you might just have totally modern object then you might have um i should probably get my own notes up but anyway not to belabor it too much you know then you might have a thing that's sca sca specific like a cooler cozy this is not something that existed in the middle ages because they weren't covering up you know, plastic coolers. So, but it, so it's sort of, a, it's not really medieval, but it does make sense for our society. So that's a little more authentic Then you know, from there on up, you might have something that's sort of like what I call a generic medieval, like, like a half circle cloak. Could be from any number of cultures across 500 years or so. And maybe they haven't pinned it down that much. They just made a half circle cloak and okay that's a little more authentic you know and then you keep going up from there to where you're going from actual looking at actual objects and reading about actual objects and looking at archaeological reports and so on but it it kind of helps people understand you know with visual examples it helps just show that there is a continuum and you know maybe you maybe you aren't ready to write the research paper but you can still push your your level up a little bit you know, with, with keeping certain things in mind. That's where I came from, um, is doing a lot of costuming um, and in the anime kind of geek, you know, comic book world. And yeah. so those are the only kind of competition, well, competitions. Um, and I mean, they did like props. And so that was why I was asking, I'm like, uh, because I saw like what would encourage you and I'm like well that would encourage me if I know if I was going up against other beginners who like maybe never entered into a competition you know even if they have been in the SEA maybe they're just now taking up I don't know whatever because I don't even know what kinds of arts and sciences things that qualify like you know is it all and then so but but just knowing like oh I'm not going to have to compete against someone who's been doing this for 20 years you know and who has perfected their craft that would intimidate me uh, coming into it versus someone who's like, yep, here's another beginner. And the people who have been practicing whichever science and or craft can then be, you know, so just more against their own like peers. Um, uh, unless, you know, it's like, it's open to anyone and you can decide what category, but I, it's nice to know that I could join in. And I don't necessarily think it's smaller or larger because like, I wouldn't even want to join a smaller competition if I'm still competing against someone who's a master level at, uh, I, I don't know, like whatever the categories are. Um, and so that's why I'm like, I just want to kind of find out more about it. I mean, I kind of understand overall some of the arts and science things, but I don't know the breadth and depth that it involves. And so I don't know if they have similar categories. Well, um... One of the things, I don't know how much familiarity you have with the sort of SCA framework, but you know, one of the elements that's probably pretty different from a anime type or science fiction costuming is that we're going, we're trying to emulate things within the specific time period. Um, what is it? What is it? 1600 these days is the cutoff. And so before that, it used to only go as far as about 650 AD, but now we're going all the way back <laughs> as far as you want to go. So, so basically we're looking in any competition, well, most competitions, I, I would say there are some competitions like Baroness's Choice where the Baroness just chooses what she likes and it doesn't matter. To, if it doesn't matter to her that it's really period or not, that's fine, she just likes it. But most of the time in arts and sciences competition is going to be looking for objects that relate to that time period <clears throat> that relate to a specific time and place not just kind of a generic european medieval but you know say france in the 13th century or something like that and 
and tying your item to historical items so that rather than you know making something up from entirely from your imagination you're basing it on something in the record is ideal you know and this is not to say that you can't be creative with it and customize it and make you know put your own emblems on it or whatever but but the idea is you kind of have that starting point in mind thank you mm -hmm. and the range of of arts and sciences are just about anything i mean if you can make it it falls into a and s you know it's woodwork it's pottery it's it's fiber arts it's um metal craft it's um cooking you know tattooing even. Was, yeah you know <laughs> um so it, it if it's a, a thing and you can make it, then ANS deals with it. You know, you're not hitting people with it or throwing it or propelling it at them. <laughs> so it's kind of ANS. <laughs> and we're not even talking about Bardic either when it gets down to it. Right. Which is yeah. another part of ANS. Which falls into that, but is its own yeah. thing. So yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting thing here in, in Ontario. It seems like, at least from my experience in other places, kind of the bardic thing is much more highly developed here as its own uh, as its own art rather than being lumped in with the arts and sciences per se. Uh, but I think it's kind of interesting, you know, they, they generally have their own competitions. So yeah, okay. I might be able to help um, explain, well, at least I'll, I'll just share We lost you, Brynjar. We lost your audio. We're not hearing you there. Brynjar. Better? Oh, okay, now I can hear you, yeah. Sorry. Oh, apparently I hit the wrong button. Okay, so <laughs> let, me, let me back up. So uh, in my uh, Summit's ANS that I entered, I, I got a book and on that book, it had some historical tools. One of those tools was a woodworking thumb shave. Um, and it had some some rough information about the size and dimension and picture. Uh, dual thumb, but yes, <laughs> uh, for woodworking. And so when I entered the competition, I had the choice of what rubric I wanted to use. One was object. Basically, they just looked at the object, asked how I kind of made it, and that was about it. The other one was process, where they really asked me a lot more in depth about how I made it. So that was my first experience. Now, what I did enjoy about that particular experience is the people who were my judges were people who had made tools like that in the past. They were blacksmiths, they were skilled in metal crafting and metal arts. So I was talking with people who had an understanding of what I was doing, what my goals were, and the complexity of what I was trying to do. Okay. And then are you, um, for, for these things, are you, uh, like the potters, are they compared to other potters versus like potters versus like blacksmiths or that kind of thing? Um, or does it depend on the event? It depends on the competition for what I understand. So that's where the rubric comes in. So the rubric gives you points, one to a hundred points. And then based on your specific area you chose, so say you chose pottery and you wanted it judged on the object, you would say earn 75 points. Someone else may have chose documentation where they're being judged on maybe their format of the documentation. I don't know what that rubric is, but I'm just throwing something out there. Um, and then they get 
65 points. Well, you've earned more points than they did. So it's point based. You're not really being judged on other potters. You're being judged on, I guess, your specific area and how you've mastered that. And, and level of authenticity. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Right. It's it's difficult to explain, but but yes, there is some level of um, median judgment on all of the arts and sciences in the bigger competitions. Um, but you do have those that are more specific, where maybe you're just competing against other people who are cooking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and I hope um, that's uh, ideally, ideally, you would be judged by other potters or other customers. So those would be the people who would kind of assign your level of authenticity, your level of achievement. But then somebody else in a general competition who's an armorer or a, a blacksmith would hopefully be judged by other blacksmiths and that person would be kind of ranked within their uh, specialty of you know how good a blacksmith are you so then it becomes a question of how good of a blacksmith is person a relative to how good of a potter is person b so the judging gets a little eh, difficult or convoluted at uh, sometimes uh, that's why it's good to have those standardized judging sheets just to kind of hopefully get everybody playing on the same field. I do want to point out, though, things are not always standardized. I mean, there are ones, I guess, that this kingdom uses a lot now, but many, many contests, the judge or the organizer is going to pick one of many. So I think this is part of what we were talking about earlier with letting people know what the rubric is, because I use a different rubric for decorated useful object at Eggles than I do for costuming at Eggles. You know, and I mean, that that's given to me. I don't really get to choose. The contest organizer gives that to me, and I just pray that it's a form that's easy to use. So you're not always getting a 100-point scale. You might be getting a 20-point a scale or, or whatever. Um, so just keep it that that makes it difficult but it also means because everybody's got different approaches and may value slightly different things but what you're going to see valued consistently is is going to be um you know workmanship and tying it to the historical record in in some way and documentation is how you show that connection how is the object you made connected to historical things and where it is or where does it differ and why Cindy if you would like a copy of our recent newsletter it contains a nice article by Steve Prognovar um, on how to use the internet for documentation it has Raven's um, scale of everything from creative and fantasy all the way up through scholarship in terms of levels of authenticity. Um, it, you know, you might find it, it useful if you want to, in the um, messages, if you want to send me your e email, I can send you a copy of that. Yes, thank you. Let me send you a message. Okay, great. And uh, I mean, I, I'll put out there, I, my thing is documentation, research. Uh, so I would be more than happy to help anybody that needs, needs help in trying to find information. I can't guarantee any that I can, that we can find it, but I can help you figure out how to do that. Uh, and uh, and also help with kind of writing it up at either a simplified level or a, or a complex level. I'm you know that's what I love to do. So uh, you know, I offer that I offer that assistance for anybody that wants it. Okay, 
Hey, Bryn, you're glad you could make it. Yeah, thanks for, for thanks for tuning in. I think you had said you were working out of town. Yeah, so, I'm, in, I'm in Roseburg in my my luxurious, you know, bottom dollar hotel room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we have got internet. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, as far as future projects, um, my project's probably gonna take me a couple of years. Um, my intent is to uh, recreate the entire master mirror box. So, uh, and I'm not talking just the box, tools and all. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I've got quite a laundry list of things to do now. Anyway, uh -huh. thank you very much. I love the insight. Thank you for everyone who showed up, especially the new individuals. And I hope to see everyone at events. Be safe. Yeah. Thanks, Bernard. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, gee, yeah, looking forward to seeing you at events. Thanks so much for coming in tonight. All right, Bonnie, you're, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I got to know you as Bonnie. That's I, okay. I, I, I have to work on, I have to work on SCA names. That's one of the problems that we have in the SCA that everybody has at least two different names. And depending on whether you met them under one name or the other, it can That's be very what difficult sticks. to catch up. Yep. <laughs> so your hands up. Oh, well, that's been a while and I forgot to put it down. I am sorry. Oh, um, oh, okay. I'm trying to remember what I put my hand up for. Oh. It's gone now. Sorry. Okay. Oh. It was something in Brynjir's conversation, but I lost it. A senior moment. Yep. Uh, okay, so I have another thing to bring up. Um, now, you know, again, you know, I've been in the SCA for a long time, uh, and I mean, the many years, almost entirely in Kaid, which for Cindy is Southern California. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, they do things differently down there. Uh, and I'm not one to say that different is better or worse or anything like that, just different is different. Uh, one thing that I've noticed here locally in, in Ontario is that the standard competition format involves basically an oral presentation. At the, uh, at the baronial level, it was just sitting down at a table and presenting my work to the judges. Uh, at the principality level, it was actually doing a stand-up uh, uh, public speaking 15, 20 minute presentation to uh, an assembled audience. Uh, now, I can do that. My, you know, my career, uh, uh, I'm now retired, but I was, uh, you know, I am very uh, trained and comfortable as a public speaker. Uh, but I know that that just freaks the heck out of a lot of people. And I'm just curious if, is that a, um, is that a, a, a detriment? Is that a reason that people don't participate? I think that that's very much something that the principality or the barony needs to make clear as part of the competition is what do you want in your champion? Is the champion's job to further the arts and sciences in which case maybe some public speaking ability would be a good thing. And if so, that should be made clear because if people say, that's eh, not me, I'm a great maker, but uh, you know. Um, so again, I think communication gets in the way and, and that we don't always make our expectations clear. I mean, if I were the Baroness and I was saying I want a champion, I'm that would be something I would see as an asset. So that would, you know, as opposed to just somebody who was in, say, decorated useful object or the a costume contest at Eggles, where you're just looking for the expertise in creating the thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think again, it, it we have to be clearer on 
And I think that needs to come from the prince and princess or the baron and baroness as to what is it you want in your champion, a wearer of the coronets, you know, um, because that's a very fair question. And some people might be more interested or less interested, depending on what the role of the champion is. If it's just to stand around and look pretty and wear the baldric or whatever, fine. You know, <laughs> but if you if you are expected to to speak up and carry on, then that should be made clear so that people don't go, oh my God, I didn't I didn't want to do that, <laughs> you know, because that's intimidating if if that's not your thing. Right. Yeah. And when I, I oh I if, if I could just uh, uh, add one more thing onto that, if you don't do a presentation. If you don't do a spoken presentation, then that generally puts more emphasis on the written documentation, just to present what it is that you do. Um, and I know people don't like doing written documentation either. I, I, and so it's just kind of a question of which one freaks people out less. There's an in between, um, because when I was when I was in the competition, um, everything happened in one room. All the displays were set up together. And a lot of people were moving through there and talking with each of the entrants. Um, it wasn't a single presentation. Um, I, like I said, I never did figure out who all the judges were. I had my suspicions, but I was concentrating on what I was talking about, so I wasn't paying that much attention. But it was that would be an option to if people are intimidated by doing like a full on class or lecture or something like that. It doesn't bother me, but so, some people it does. I know, um, but I had oh, I don't know, four to six people clustered around the table and then a couple of them would wander off and a couple more would wander in and I just kept right on going, answering questions and talking about what I had. And so that would be an in-between. I know a lot of the co uh, competitions and the one that I actually I did the following year uh, were based on having all the judges there at once and doing all their judging and questions and everything at once. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure that's what happens at kingdom level too. Um, but that, like I said, that would be an option. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alan, I think you, I, I saw a, a comment flash by, uh, and I don't know where to pull up comments. Ah. At the bottom, there's a little speech bubble that says chat. Oh, that one. Okay, yeah. got yes. it. Yes. Okay. I, I sent him a message saying that I would take him up on his offer. And I the question I'd asked him is if I have sent him something from a previous competition, would he be willing to look it over and return it with a critique? Because I just, when I submitted my item, this would have been years ago, I never got any feedback. And I uh, this is one of the reasons why I've been kind of soured and then I went through all this work and they said, and the new winner is, I said, what about the rest of us? And I pretty much said, well, thank you for competing. I said, no, I'm, I'm looking for feedback. They said, that will be all. Next event. Is that the one? Yeah. Seem to have musical background here. Well. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Not me. Okay, so you, you sent this to me? Yes, I sent you a private uh, message. Okay, yeah, here we are. All right, all right. I'll take a look at it later. All all right. I promise I will get back to you. Fair enough. Is that the one I also looked at, the ring one or a different one? Yeah, the ring one. I, if no, I don't know well, whether I got feedback on it, but not from the original. Sorry. So I've given you feedback on it, but you're saying you didn't get it from the oh. original judges, which. I disagree is lame. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I got no feedback at the original competition. How's that? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's that's unfortunate to my to my mind. That's a large part of the reason for entering is getting the feedback. 
maybe one of the challenges is sometimes, you know, if you're being, if the judge is an expert in the field, getting the judge to, uh, to realize that you're not, uh, but still feedback is a, is an important part of the process. Yeah, I think that's also a significant thing for the person organizing the competition to consider is picking your judges, because there are certainly people yeah. who have different philosophies. And I always try to go for constructive criticism, but not everyone is that way. So, you know, depending on what you philosophically want the experience to be, you know, helps to know, or at least a few people who can say, okay, I've judged with this person and here's what they're like, you know, and, and, and making clear to your judges as well, we want you to put down some comments, you know, don't just do the math. I always try to put something on the back. I mean, it is tougher when you have a lot of entries, but I agree that it should be very, it's a very important part of the process because otherwise it is just mysterious, you know. I, why did that win and I didn't? <laughs> well, I will say uh, for the, the rubric that we're using, every time I've been called to judge, there'll be a panel of judges and each, one, each individual one of us submits the, the judging form that has notes scribbled just all over everywhere. And one of the, the nice things about it as well is everybody else is submitting their judging forms on white paper and I'm submitting mine on yellow paper, which means I have a shaved tail and I'm just starting out here. Mm -hmm. So when people see the, the comments coming in, they say, who's this person uh, you know, writing all these nasty comments in yellow? Oh, wait a minute, that's Alan. He, He's still trying to figure out his way around the, the hotel. <laughs> well, I think that speaks to the importance of, of training your judges, or if you're running the contest, like the three pillars thing at Eggles, sitting them down before the judging starts and saying, you know, this is what we're looking for in terms of you know, I, I know a woman who's very competent, but she describes herself as I'm the East German judge. And she comes on really <laughs> strong. Well, that may be fine at the Kingdom ANS level where it's heavy duty competition, but it's very off-putting at a baronial level because you have people for whom this is maybe their first competition in the SCA and that's not what they want or need. So that if, um, I mean, the last time I ran Three Pillars, I had a little handout, which I put in the in the bear, um, ways to start positive criticism, you know, sentence starters. Because yeah. sometimes, you, you know, you just don't know what to say, but with some prompts, you can go, oh, well, yeah, that I could say that about the thing. One and of my favorites is um, you could explore such and such. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, instead of saying, you totally lacked this. Why didn't you have this? Just say you might consider looking at these types of sources, or you know that I've I've picked up a lot of that from Fiorleaf, judging with Fiorleaf. Actually, she's really a master at constructive criticism. <laughs> but yeah, there's almost always a way to say it that isn't insulting or demeaning, and I just feel like that's so. I, I don't understand that approach at any level, honestly, but that's just a, a stylistic preference. You know, I, I don't feel like tearing people down builds them back up unless they're a very tough kind of person. And a lot of us are not, we're, you know. <laughs> it's a we're volunteer military, organization. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a volunteer organization. We don't, we get enough of that in real life, you know. Not the Olympics. <laughs> I just have to be harsh, yeah. So yeah, that's my take on it. That may be a piece of what formed my lack of interest in competition. Because mm -hmm. early on, I did enter competitions for garb, et cetera. And it was in a time period, you know, the, the SC is no different than any other social group. There are pendulum swings. And at that time period, there were an awful lot of uh, Garb Nazis, authenticity Nazis. And it wasn't always kindly delivered. So it was like, eh, why bother? Did my best. It was okay. I don't want to hear that. 
you know, I, costuming has always seemed like a really tough uh, venue to me. Uh, but then that I'm I'm not involved in costuming. As a matter of fact, well, in if if anybody knows about inner kingdom uh, anthropology, uh, one of the common lines is "Welcome to Kaid, now get dressed." <laughs> um, and one thing that I learned early on when I was like brand spanking new in the SCA is that the uh, the costuming powers that be had absolutely no interest in 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 Viking era. So that's that's why I'm a Viking. <laughs> <laughs> but you've now moved to Viking I, uh, Central. We okay, had a gal well, who came through is, um... Um, in the '80s. She had uh, was fostering a friend's daughter, and they were making a grand tour of the U.S., staying with SCA households and she said i heard this rumor is it true that you have to have a norse persona to be king in ontario <laughs> <laughs> this was back when we would had a run of yeah. nothing but norse kings for several years <laughs> yeah well it has been observed that weather in the pacific northwest lends itself more to wool garb than it does in kaid you know <laughs> so yes. that may be part yeah, of it very but, much so but honestly um there is just in it seems to be an intense amount of snobbery in some places not to say that on tier doesn't have snobbery but um but i think we're a little more open to a wider range of time periods and cultures in some places because yeah there are definitely kingdoms or places that i've heard where it's like yeah if you're not 14th century then i'm not even going to talk to you or um specifically another laurel i know who has also has a scythian persona was told by a Laurel and Kaid that her peerage didn't count because she had nothing to do with the medieval period. So uh -huh. that's snobbery for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> to which she had a good laugh, but you know, that's because she was at a level where she could laugh that off, whereas somebody would have been perished by that. Well, that's the kind of spiteful thing that we just don't need. <laughs> Yeah. But I think the whole competition thing is, is vastly complicated by the breadth of the SCA and the varying depth to which people go. And I mean, it's, it's almost an impossible task when you have something as generic as ANS champion. I mean, Bardic champion, okay, you're going to be singing or reciting or performing. You know, you've narrowed it down a little bit. But when you can have somebody, you know, carving a rune stone or making garb or throwing a pot or, you know, making crispinets and, and Elizabethan scent bags, and they're all in the same competition, you know, I mean, you all you can do is compete against a rubric. Um, right. And, you know, and it's it's still kind of apples and orange because there's a well-made simple thing better than a sort of well-made complicated thing. I mean, we're back with the stone and the guitar. And again, there's other criteria that need to have been placed on, you know, what do we what do we want the winner to do? do or be able to do or represent. Um, so I think communication is, is and, and clarity and making sure that the expectations are clear are just essential. Otherwise you end up with people who have bad experiences and get hurt feelings and get turned off. And we might better have had a display. You know, if you're competing to be champion of something, well, yeah, you probably should learn how to do documentation because that's part of it you know i mean you're a champion you know your stuff you know where it comes from and if you need some help with putting it together that's one thing but i i also don't want us to say well you know it's not that important documentation is just this big scary thing documentation is part of the game you know you just have to help people understand how to how to take joy in it and present it. 
because that's what a lot of people really enjoy doing. Enjoy research. Well, a lot of people enjoy that, and a lot of people are daunted by it. It's the old high school report. Yeah. Thing, or the, the final exam stuff. If we present it as, look, just tell us where you found the information you're working from so we know how much research you did. You know, it just yeah. helps us yeah. all understand, gives us something to share with the next person that wants to learn. Maybe they want to go read that research too. Exactly. It's how you present it. Yeah. A lot of the time I tell people, just tell us what you did, you know, and in the process, you're going to tell us where you found the information. Um, but I'm more into the experimental archaeology end of it. So maybe that has has something to do with it. Not sure. The why is important, too. That's what I tend to to phrase it, you know, did you, is it because you made it up out of your head, which is one approach, or is it because you saw this thing in a book or you saw somebody else wearing that thing or, you know, why? That'll tell us a lot about, yeah, where you get your info and how you use your info. You know, so uh, Rodnavar, with your, your question about the championship competitions, I don't think it would be at all out of place to go back to the prince and princess or the baron and baroness and say, I've looked at what's in the customs or the summit's laws and it doesn't give you much. You know, you get to stand by the throne and maybe sit at the high table, whoop de do. What do you want in a champion? <laughs> well, I always mm -hmm. thought that. Yeah. The large Principality or barony. I think that's in the rules. <laughs> By Raven, you're cutting out, isn't it? Oh, I was. I was saying. Um, I, I thought it was in the law that a large portion of it is promoting arts and sciences, not just as Pam says, looking pretty. <laughs> but promoting. What does that mean? Does that mean teaching? Right. Does that mean working with the arts and sciences officer? Because we already have an officer who's supposed to be doing that. Um, My take you know, is, enab is enabling it, you know, with, through all of those things. But yeah, that's still a very big category. And that's where you get to shape it to a certain extent. What do you think would promote it? And I think you're on the right track. Yeah. I, uh, interesting, interesting uh, side note in uh, principality, in Summit's principality and Ontier Kingdom law, uh, the various champions are labeled officers of the court, as opposed to like the arts and sciences officer and the marshal who are, oh, great officers, I think is the term that they use. Yeah. Uh, and inter Interestingly, as an officer of the court, I am not allowed to also be a great officer. I, am, I'm, I, I cannot be the arts and sciences minister, except you know, if everybody agrees and basically there has to be some public proclamation to that. So that implies that there's a, an expectation that the, uh, that the champions do something uh, beyond simply being, um, it's just not entirely clear what that is. Yeah, well, I mean, there was a discussion a few years back in summits about that very overlap because we have like five or six champions and it was cutting into people who could also serve as officers and we were spread a little thin. I mean, that, which is, you know, the same can be true in a barony. It's like, you know, how many people do you have to go around right. um, and who are willing to serve as officers or in an active champion, if you want your champion out there promoting things, um, sometimes champions show up, win it, and you never hear from them until the next year. Um, you know, it varies wildly. Um, yeah. My guess is that the person to talk to at the principality level about this will be Luciano, who is already a Viscount. He's been Prince of the Summits before. When he was, he was the one who completely went through the laws and rewrote them. 
He's an incredibly able administrator. Um, and he also has a sense of theater and flair. And I think that when you get around to the summits part of it, that a conversation with him could be very productive and he may have some thoughts about that. Okay, great. Yeah, it, it, it seems to me to agree with what you just said, it seems to me to be in kind of an unnecessary limitation on potential manpower. Well, could your exchequer um, be ANS champion or rapier champion? I mean, no. But why not? Yeah. I but, mean, but I, why I, not? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't overlap at all, really. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. I, I, we've covered all of the highlights that I had written down that I wanted to hear about and more. Uh, does anybody else have any anything they'd like to add? This has been a very enlightening discussion. I thank you all very much. Well, I really appreciate that you were interested in doing this. And I think we should all go forth and share this information that it's not such a big deal. Go out, compete, play, have fun. This and, from and me who doesn't compete. Yeah. Well, and you know, that that's that's my interest. And I guess, you know, having uh you know being and uh being in the art arts area, uh, but being more of an information monger rather than a producer of pretty artifacts. Uh, you know, opportunities for displaying my wares are somewhat limited. Uh, um, you know, showing what I do, uh, you know, it's pretty much it's, you know, it's publishing in, uh, in TI or complete anachronist. Uh, and, you know, if it's not for things like competitions, I, you know, I don't really have many, uh, many targets. I don't have many deadlines that I have to work to. Um, so, uh, you know, pe people who are customers wear their, uh, their art at events, uh, but, you know, people who generate information, uh, you know, it's just, it's harder in ways. You get to teach classes, though. Uh, teach classes, yeah, <laughs> I like to do that. Okay. And and you've shared other things with us, brewing and other interesting aspects. Any, like you said earlier, anything you, you do or can make in the SCA is pretty much falls in that arts and sciences field. Yeah, right. I, I would like to see us have, and COVID has messed with all of my grandiose plans. I really would like to see us have a lot of small displays and competitions and just encouraging people to make the stuff, do the thing, learn, get out of here and try it so that they can see it's not so hard. Yeah. Um, now, uh, again, I'm a new guy here. Uh, I actually have not yet uh, attended a, an outdoor event in Ontario. Uh, just, you know, <laughs> timing and, uh, and COVID and all that. Uh, so my experience at, uh, on tier events is very limited. Um, in the past where I used to live, it was pretty much expected that every single event had some arts and sciences component. If, you know, a, a display or, you know, the, uh, just the people of the barony putting their stuff out and inviting comment. Uh, so that was just an everyday thing. I, I, is that common here? Fairly uh, common. Yeah, we uh, just about every event from Birthday Bash on up, uh, arts and science generally has its very own tent and you'll frequently see uh, display cases filled with these are stuff that we're working on at the moment. Uh, very oh, okay, informal, cool. very informal, but it gives a chance for people to, to walk by and say, oh, that looks cool. 
what people here in town are making that i'd like to know more about how to do that mm -hmm. okay good you know i'm gonna say i you know i just just don't know now if and i so, may uh, some yeah. people are, are are very poor at promoting themselves uh i can think of one in particular <clears throat> who uploaded a document uh to the the baronies file section on how to do research uh <laughs> yes where is that oh yes resources for research by a steve alter person uh i suggest that people might <clears throat> Uh, want to download that there's it's i'm always oh, amazed you read how, it? yes i'm always amazed how oh much wow <laughs> now we were just discussing this at lunch uh you could have a hundred people it? you could have a hundred people download that steve and you'll never know about it which is unfortunate mm -hmm. well i mean that, that's that's one of the things that i say in there you know scholars love fan mail uh I, you know i i would i I have published papers in in scientific journals and never heard a peep from anybody about any of them. And it's kind of discouraging after a while, you know. <laughs> so uh, so good, cool. and and I, I refer to that as a perpetual work in progress. I am constantly learning new stuff and and amending that with with new. Uh, new things as, as I find them. Well, I've taken a lot of things that you said in that to heart. Uh, I'm not allowed to return home at the moment. I'll have to wait until international travel is possible again. But I do promise you next time I'm back in England, I will make sure that for months before that, I'm sending really nice little letters to curators and all the museums I'll be going to saying, you know what, I've never seen what the backside of that buckle looks like. It'd be any mm -hmm. way possible that I can have a chance to photograph both sides of this buckle. So yes, I I I found that it was very good reading, and I suggest that anybody here listening, if you haven't seen it yet, go into our file section and download, look it over. Great. Well, thank you for the plug. Uh, yeah, um, I I don't know if you're familiar with Alan Williams, uh, armor at the. Uh, uh, Oh, armor at, at a, a uh, 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 of Wallace London. collection, the Wallace collection. Oh, in uh, in England, uh, and uh, been there. Uh, I got in, I got into a great uh, back and forth with him. You know, I just wrote to him out of the blue and asked him some questions on on things, and you know, like I say in in the paper. You know, once you get people started talking, if you know you tell them that you're interested in their work, oftentimes you know it's not a problem getting them started; it's a problem getting to, them to stop. <laughs> That's certainly true with SCA folks. <laughs> so great. So wow, this is this is this has been a great discussion. I mean, we we're we've gone for two hours and. Uh, uh, gotten a lot of gotten a lot of interesting information. If anybody has anything else to bring up, I'd uh, love to hear it. If you have any ideas or any uh, any anything that you don't think was uh, adequately covered, if something occurs to you, please uh, drop me a line. Uh, I'll be talking to people and uh, and trying to formulate some ideas. Well, as always, Steve, if there's anything I can help you to do to complete what you're aiming at for these two upcoming competitions, please let me know. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's good to know. So everybody who's here already knows if you want to hang around and chit chat and share your latest projects, we can do that. If you want to go home and say, I'm tired, we can do that too. <laughs> I have a couple of ladies from Clundara, which is San Francisco, who show up just about the time we're ready to close out. They just come for the fun and to share their projects. <laughs> That's kind of nice. Yeah. Anya, Anya, Ooh. she's got something. Ooh. Ooh. Nice. Say something so your picture will be centered and we can get a better close up of it.
Oh, she's got her mic turned off. Your microphone's off, Anya. <laughs> there she is. Oh, huh. sorry about that. Um, okay, this is the one that I finished tonight. Of course, now I can't get to anything right. Ah, this mirror image thing. Um, that These are both from the new Carolingian modal book too. And this one I happen to know is a pattern from an extant item in the Ashmolean. Um, so more of my bookmark thingamabobs. Oh, and you said that I could put a plug in uh, for the workshops that we're doing at the feast. Okay, House Capuchin does a winter feast. It is not an official event. Um, and we end up conflicting with things about one year out of three at least. Uh, but we, we have the event on a Sunday. This year we've got it set for the, the 13th of February. And we have set up so far two um, workshops. Uh, the theme for the feast this year is Norse, uh, basically Viking era Norse. Um, so we have somebody doing a class on festoons, a workshop on making the festoons, the things you wear on the front of your gown. And uh, there it will be a materials cost for that. Um, but we also have somebody, Alpha Officium has agreed to make some of the little shield medallions with bales on them so they can be added to a festoon. So that's going to be in the event information once that starts going around. Um, <clears throat> The other workshop is going to be Norse wire weaving. And just they were things that people in the in the group uh, requested. So things that fit with the uh, with the theme of the event. And yeah, we've been having all kinds of fun um, with working out foods and things. I did a I keep talking about the lamb roll that I did, um, which was lamb pickled kale and garlic. Go figure. It was delicious. Mm. Um, mm. But we're working uh, right this month. My my test recipe is the spit roasted chicken and the bread that's boiled in a bag. So <laughs> some fun stuff. Um, but uh, somewhere in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll put up a notice, spread it around the various branches. Um, anybody who's here from outside of the summits, uh, the we'll put it up also on the summits uh, discussion group so you, you can access it if you want to come to the event and you're not a house member and it's a free event by the way um, it's something the house does just as a gift to the other crazy people in the world um, but if you want to come to the event you have to message me or whoever ends up putting up the the notice um, that way we have some control over how much food we have to buy and everything else. Um, okay, then that's my thing. Thank you. Okay, I just have to ask if lamb rolling is anything like cow tipping. <laughs> it certainly sounds like it. Um, actually, the, the thing is you're supposed to, we did it with actually um, ground lamb to make it easier to do. But apparently you're supposed to take a lamb steak and then roll it up and then you boil it, uh, you tie it up or wrap it in cloth and boil it in lamb bone broth along with things like the boiled bread and boiled peas in a bag and some things along those lines. Lots of fun stuff. But yes, it does sound a lot like cam tipping. <laughs> cam tipping. <laughs> And I'm not at all fond of lamb, but I tasted some of that, and it was really quite tasty. It's I never thought of adding pickled kale to anything, ever. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to do something with it, you know. Who, who thinks of making pickled kale first off? <laughs> yeah. Well, I pickled just about everything that held still long enough. So, they, they, me, I pickled kale, and the last jar of pickled kale we had we ended up using it as garnish and 90 percent of it landed in the compost mm. my Arg. my ex-daughter-in-law was native american and 
out of a series of very strange events, I ended up moving into a rental that her family had moved out of. And they left behind a whole cabinet full of canned goods. And mm. every bit of it was pickled. The meats, the fruits, the vegetables, they were all pickled because you didn't have to have a, a processor to, you know, yeah. just water bath. And I asked them about that. So, oh, yeah, we've always done that. That's the way the family does that, meaning Native Americans. So that was interesting to me. So pickled kale. Okay. <laughs> well, easy way to preserve it. Yeah. 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 Well, At least uh, keep it wild. One thing. Um, uh, I, I found that about three three months is tops on that. But considering how, you know, kale grows in the garden, yeah. Yeah, we uh, uh, we processed our excess kale by uh, putting it in the dehydrator and uh, uh, drying it and then put it in a food processor and turn it into dust. So it compresses by about 50 fold in uh, for storage. Uh, and then this kale dust is really useful to put in like stews or uh, or soups or things as a thickening agent. Uh, so it's really handy that way. Uh, and it doesn't taste like kale. <laughs> I was going to say you'd have to be careful not to overdo it. <laughs> if you cook it long enough, kale stops tasting like kale. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to know. <laughs> the advantage of putting it in stew. <laughs> yeah, right. Hi, Helen. Hey, guys. Hey, hi. Hey. Nice to see you. Yeah. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. I was just heading off to bed, and then I saw your message. Ah. Better late than never. Oh, I know. I know. Evenings get busy. So, so what am I? What am I popping into? What's everybody doing? Chit chat. Oh, cool. What you Very been working cool. on? Share share your projects. Oh my gosh. Um. There's so many. <laughs> right now. <laughs> I'm making a 18th century shirt for my friend in Williamsburg. So I can get that off in the mail. Making Neat. five, let's see, five male size medium tunic, under tunics and linen. And then I've got it. I just started cutting out the wool tunics. Um, what else? I'm making, uh, getting ready to just cut out an 18th century uh, pair of stays and working on three quilts <laughs> yeah i'm busy oh uh, my <laughs> i know it's crazy we are busy. Good. yeah i just finished let me see if i can reverse my how do i reverse the picture hmm. we we can probably see it backwards well, that's what i'm trying to see is how do i take it to go backwards okay well i'll show you mm -hmm. i just um, finished yeah, just chatting just finished one little kid's quilt right here. See that? So that's their Christmas present. Cute. Yeah, getting ready for the um, Norse dinner. Hey, so tell me about um, the Barency's the Barency's dinner in the winter. Never been to it. So what's that about? You mean Midwinter's Feast or yes. Twelfth Night? Yeah. No, Midwinter's Feast. We went to Twelfth Night a couple of years ago. But it's, it's salt, you're probably the better source on that than I am. You have more detailed and complete information on that. Or did she walk away? Although she seems to have walked away. There she comes. Sorry, all my exercising and shit, so. Talking about you while you're gone, Dana Saul. Oh. No, she's busy. Hmm. There she comes. We're waiting for you. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Helen has a question. 
and you're a good source. What for what? About the the midwinter's feast. How is how does that work? Like, do we need to buy tickets? Is it? Uh, um, how is it functioning? That will. Um, bye, Cindy. Bye, Cindy. Thanks for bye -bye. coming. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Um, midwinters usually, I mean, it, they'll post later on online, but usually you have to pre-register just so we, you know, know how many people are coming for the food part. Right. Um, and with the COVID things, I think they're requiring pre-registration for all events now. So there will be something up in the Adiantum, you know, chat group about that. Um, but yeah, there probably will be pre-registration, both so COVID you, and, and, you know, feast ticket kind of thing. Tell her more about how that works, how it occurs, the experience of it. Oh, well, it depends from year to year, but usually it's an all day event and you have, um, there are two or three championships that are done at midwinters. I don't, I think maybe rapier might be one of them. Uh, maybe you're in cut and thrust cut and thrust and then and is that what a and s yes yeah and so arts and sciences so we have those competitions during the day um and then usually a feast in the late afternoon or evening i think it's going to be late afternoon judging from the hours because i think they're closing the site at nine so um Sometimes there's also like a simple lunch by kind of thing about I don't know if that'll still be the case but um and there's usually some some kind of SCA business meetings which anybody's welcome to attend if they're just sort of curious about the nuts and bolts aspects yeah not so much business at midwinters but sometimes yeah well, sometimes there's various things yeah. yeah and then the feast there's usually a, a court of some kind uh in the sense of the um, and awards might be given out and gifts might be given out and things of that nature, maybe some performances. Yeah. So oh. it's, you know, a little bit of everything kind of, it's usually a good laid back kind of event for just, you know, chatting with people and meeting them and, you know, the competitions kind of take place wherever they take place. And you can kind of watch that if you're interested or you just find a place to sit down and schmooze with people. Um, Work on projects since, you know, a lot of people bring their sewing or their scribal, maybe they're painting in some award scrolls, that kind of thing, just whatever you want to work on during the day that fits in with the themes. Yeah. Is there is there a, a certain time period for it, or can we just wear whatever? Oh, whatever. Sometimes they've been themed, it, usually for the feast itself. You know, just because somebody decides, well, I'm going to do Iberian Peninsula. We did one of those a few years back, but um, the event itself, no. It's just it's midwinter court and a good time yeah. to be had by all, really. You oh, cool. hardly, hardly ever see an, a like public SCA event that where people are expected to wear a certain time period or whatnot. I mean, you might, you, they might say the theme of this is maybe we're going to do the feast in Roman style. And if you want to, you could dress up Roman, but you certainly don't have to. So, you know, come as you <laughs> come in what you have to wear <laughs> that would be comfortable in a warm, like don't wear your wool because it gets really warm. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, see, that's good to know because we yeah. might have shown up in our wool because I'm making yeah. everybody wool Norse garb right now. Right. So at least have some layers going on because you might want that getting from the car to the site, maybe if it's pouring, <laughs> but then you might want to go a few layers lighter. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to remember Long Tom Grange. I don't remember a whole lot of feast of heat, but on the other hand, yeah, you get 80 true. people in the building and it warms up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was. It, was, it didn't have a kitchen. That's where we had it. That's yeah. where we had it last time, and it was it was pretty warm. Uh, I was definitely overdressed. It depends on the feast too, but another fun way to get involved could be um, if they call for servers. Like sometimes mm. some feast people will like have their servers in advance and 
all that. But most of the time, it seems like these days, they mostly just have one person per table say, okay, I'll do it. And it's just kind of fun. It gives you something to do and feel like you're part of the action. <laughs> so that's, that's, or if you're interested in volunteering in the kitchen, sometimes they'll need people to help peel vegetables or whatnot. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great way to get to know people. Yeah. So, yeah, there's nothing uh, like peeling a mountain of carrots with somebody to get their whole life story. <laughs> so, I, 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 I would imagine that most, uh, most people, or at least old timers, know uh, Suratilla. Um, Is it a person? And, uh, uh, hmm? A person? In. Um, uh, 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 Attila Caroli, uh, he oh, was here, uh, at least that's how I knew him. Uh, so, um, uh, he was in Kaid a long time ago, uh, while I was there and we were, we were good friends there and he liked to, uh, participate in the kitchen in, uh, just kind of cutting and dicing and just being in, you know, it was kind of a thing that he was into. Um, and like. he was a yeah. great, he was a fantastic attraction for kitchen help because <laughs> he loved running around the kitchen with his shirt off. <laughs> and so all the ladies wanted to work in the kitchen. <laughs> and my wife still has uh, very fond memories of, uh, uh, of, of that so yeah <laughs> well that used to be a tradition at uh, an event we used to have called Amergans. Uh the tradition was that after the feast the men would do the dishes and they would generally take their shirts off but uh, uh, you know I, I like to help in the kitchen but I tend to keep my shirt on <laughs> I was going to say that yeah that could be a cursing or a, uh, a curse or a blessing depending on the uh uh, on the situation as we've always, said that, we've always said that 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 showing skin is a uh, 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 is a privilege it's not a right uh, I don't agree that in around here anyway <laughs> some of my favorite times for washing dishes after a feast yep yeah yeah you meet a lot of a lot of interesting people that way I just, you know, I've always told people that just, you know, volunteering to help with events and, and all that, it's, you know, that's, that can be half the fun. Yep. Yep. You meet okay. People, I'm, they just find I'm out gonna how to, work. Yeah. I'm going to have to sign off here, folks. So okay, thank, uh, you. thank you all. Thank you for a stimulating discussion. I took a lot of notes and I hope I can do something good with them. Thank you so very much for doing this tonight. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank thank you all for your input and uh, take care. Good night. Alrighty. Night. All right.